In this video, I'm gonna share five tips that have helped me drastically improve my lyrics. And I'm gonna demonstrate those tips by analyzing real lyrics, both good and bad. I don't have the courage to bash somebody else's lyrics, including just as clickbait. Instead, I'm going to pick apart some of my own. I'm gonna focus on a song called Old Flame. I started writing it in 2013, and I have written six discrete, complete versions of the song. Old Flame, Old Flame. They span several eras of my writing and show me at my best and worst, including as a lyricist, so it's perfect fodder for a video like this. Now, let me start out as credibly as possible by quoting a legit songwriting expert. In his book, Writing Better Lyrics, Pat Pattison devotes an entire chapter to what he calls the Sister Mary Elizabeth rule of songwriting. I'll spare you the background on that reference. But the rule is show before you tell. First, hold up the object of the lyric and then say what you will. I mean, that, that sounds nice, but it begs the question, why? Pattison says that, and I'm just gonna read this, it's, it's behind you. Showing makes the telling more powerful because your senses and your mind are both engaged. He then compares the show element of a lyric to a bag of dye. Hang the dye at the top of a song section and then let it drip its colors downward onto the other lines, giving them more interest and depth. Objects like people, places, and things help a listener visualize something. That visualization can be very immersive and can be the key to a strong lyric. Let's look at an example that breaks that rule. It's the very first verse from my very first version of this song. How many ways did he brush the hair back off your face? Now, I wrote these lyrics in 2013 or 2014, and I was really proud of them at the time. Today, not so much. There are a few problems, including simple things like using the word dreaming twice. But the main problem is that the lyrics are bland. There's a central object there and a story, but I don't really show it to you, I just tell you about it. I've highlighted several lines in this lyric that I think are tell phrases. They contain meaning, but they're not evocative or immersive. They don't transport the listener anywhere, they just proffer information. And that might be efficient, but it's not very interesting. To paraphrase Pattison, those words engage the mind, but they fail to engage the senses. And since this is a song lyric and not an email, I think that's a problem. What if instead I had described a person anticipating a reunion with a former lover? I could include details about her glazed, foggy eyes, or taking a short, shallow breath every time the door opens, expecting him to walk in. Any of those details would have transformed this lyric. Now in his sister, Mary Elizabeth, whatever rule, Pattison recommends that you show and then tell. I impose on myself a stricter rule. Show, don't tell. Because I find it way too easy and natural to write bland, telling lyrics. So in practice, I feel like I get better results if I try to prioritize showing over telling in every case. It helps me remain focused on objects and using sensory images. And it leads to lyrics like this one, which is from the most recent version of Old Flame. That's almost all show and very little tell. Even the figurative language uses nouns, like objects that someone can imagine. And in my opinion, that makes it much more likely to grab a listener and drag them into the story of my song. That is the power of objects, of sensory details, of showing rather than telling. And I've made it lesson number one because it's had a bigger impact on my lyric writing than any of these others. But they're important too, so let's get to them. Bob Dylan could be like a lyrical machine gun, just like burst after burst of words and images and ideas. And for a while, I tried to write in that style, but it rarely resulted in good lyrics and it encouraged a bad habit of overwriting. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes overwriting just means too many words or syllables. For example, I've blown so many candles, I lit the same day. That's just too much, it's too many syllables. They fall in strange places and hinder the melody and obscure the words and they're awkward to sing. These are all like cardinal sins of songwriting 
thou shalt not. And other times overriding just means trying to cram in too many discreet images or ideas, such as, I don't mind these lines individually, but what happens when we pile them on top of each other? What do those images convey together, like in a group? I think the answer is nothing. At least nothing that makes any real sense. Neighboring ideas affect each other, for better or for worse. And with time, I have learned that I prefer to take a small number of images and put each of them under a microscope. That seems to more consistently result in better lyrics. And so that's what I recommend you do as lesson number two. Now, in college, I worked on many group projects, and one of them was especially memorable. My group sat together to write a paper line by line. After fielding a few of my contributions, a group mate turned to me and asked, can you write just one sentence without using a cliche? She was right. I use a lot of cliches and borrowed phrases. I, I kind of do it without thinking, sometimes because they're just familiar, and sometimes because they're shorthand for more complex ideas. And I think they can be useful, but in your song lyrics, I recommend that you avoid secondhand language. I mean, for one thing, secondhand language violates rule number one because it is rarely descriptive. Think about the last time you used a cliche or borrowed phrase. Did you mean those words literally? Did they have any relationship with the actual situation that you were describing? Or were they a shortcut to some idea or concept that everybody else is supposed to know. In my experience, it's usually the latter, and that feels like telling, not showing. And then, of course, if something's borrowed or secondhand, it's inherently derivative. And I know there's nothing new under the sun, but I still think we should try to create something when we are creating something. Clichés, like that nothing new under the sun thing, they're especially bad because they usually fail your listener. If somebody knows the cliché, they won't register it because it's neither novel nor descriptive. And if you don't know the cliché, it won't make any sense whatsoever. Like, I'm not even sitting in the sunlight. What is he talking about? That's enough background. Let's look at an example. This is a scrapped verse from 2019. Turn out the lights, empty bottles, dry ink. These are images, even specific pairs of words that you've seen or heard before many times. And in part, that's a sign of shared experience. But shared experience doesn't have to be reduced to specific words or phrases and then used to mean the typical thing. If you're going to use secondhand language, then you should try to do something to make it your own. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Jordan, you wrote a song called Old Flame about a former lover. Isn't there a cliche right at the center of your entire <laughs> song? And uh, yeah, you're right. Good catch. Clear violation of lesson number three, but let me explain. Have you ever stared into a campfire or a flickering candle? There's something fascinating, even seductive about it. I know what I do, it feels like I can't look away, like the flame has some powerful gravity within it. It's probably a caveman reaction, but if I'm near fire, I stare at it involuntarily, constantly. And as far as I know, that yearning fixation isn't part of the typical old flame idiom. But that's what I was trying to convey in the song. It's a song about being fixated on something and helplessly drawn toward it. That something happens to be an old flame, but I'm not simply reusing the idiom. I'm trying to do something with it, to imbue it with extra meaning that comes from my personal fascination with Fire. If you can expand or subvert or reinvent secondhand language, then I don't really think it violates lesson number three. But you have to be honest with yourself, because if the listener doesn't understand that nuance, then it's not there. Which brings me to... Check out these lines that I loved in 2016. After you sign your name, I spent countless days Trying to wash away, wash away any trace from my wall You know what I'm saying? No, because that shit doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, it does make sense to me. 
because I once pinned huge sheets of paper on the walls of my dorm and let people write on them, including people that were girls that I liked. Eventually I had to tear all the paper down and after I did, I would sometimes lie in bed and stare at the blank cinder block walls and imagine what had been written on them. I really liked that writing on the walls idea and I tried to force it into several songs, including this one. Unfortunately, it's virtually meaningless to everyone on earth except for me. It's like an inside joke that I'm sharing with myself. I can't imagine anyone understanding it, much less connecting with it, without some kind of explanation. The lyric on its own conveys nothing, and that means it's a bad lyric. Contrast these lines from the second verse of my latest rewrite. There's figurative language there, but you don't have to be a psychic to understand it. Someone out there has watched their lovers smile like they're reading your mind. You know that smile. You can remember it, or maybe you can imagine it, or at least interpret it, all without having to read my mind or have shared in my specific life experiences. The listener will never be able to see the insides of our heads, thankfully. So be wary of any lyrics that rely too heavily on your specific unique life experiences. I know that can be hard because sometimes those are the things that seem to make your life exciting. Unfortunately, they don't translate that well to other people in the context of a lyric. Lyrics that are sung can pass by pretty quickly, much more quickly than words on a page, and you can't explain them in the middle of a song. So give the listener a chance to keep up and stay away from things that only you can understand. In early 2021, I decided to write Old Flame from scratch for the fifth time. I wasn't happy with the prior versions, and I knew how I had written them. I had forced them. Not, not on purpose, I was just excited about the song and eager to finish it, so I wrote it, worked it, I pushed hard, as hard as I could. And that's great for getting a song, but forced writing has some downsides. It leads me to make choices that are easy, safe, and lazy all in the service of getting a song as soon as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, the process of forcing a song is neither easy nor lazy. In fact, it's neither. Forced writing is hard. It takes a lot of work, which then kind of increases the pressure to finish, like right now, which makes me push harder, etc., etc. That's how I wrote the earliest versions of Old Flame. It was hour after hour of good intentions, but forced writing. And it led to a few good ideas, but not without a lot of effort and a lot of luck. So in 2021, I tried something different. I sat down to write, but I didn't write anything. I just sat there still and thought about my song, what it meant to me and what I had tried to convey in those earlier versions. I let myself drift into memories of people and places and moments. And I let all of those memories kind of like bump into each other. And sometimes they bounce off. Sometimes they kind of merge. It was gently cacophonous as it can sometimes be inside of a brain. And it was all kind of guided by this concept of an old flame burning again. And I did this for like 30 minutes or an hour. Did nothing, at least it sort of felt like nothing compared to my normal way of writing. But it wasn't nothing because eventually my thoughts settled on a particular image. It was part memory and part fantasy, but it was clear. And that's when I began to write, to put that specific image into words. And it wasn't easy, but it was easier. Normally, I'd try to find and express meaning at the same time. I thought that's how you were supposed to write, and it does feel inspired when you land on something you like. But here, I had separated those steps. I already knew what I wanted to say. So I'd sort of sucked out some of the opportunity for that eureka feeling. But in exchange, I found it much easier to express the thing I was trying to express. That was one of the first times that I really followed lesson number five, and it wasn't easy. It didn't feel natural, but with time and repetitions, it got better. Now this is my new normal, and I think that it has improved the quality and consistency of my lyrics. And it streamlined my process. Even though I now have a new period of like pondering, I'm spending a lot less time trying to search for or force words. And all in all, I think song lyrics are coming much faster. These are all huge benefits, and that's why I strongly recommend that you follow lesson number five. Stop and think until you have a clear idea of what you want to say 
before you start to write. When I sat down to uh, re, 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 rewrite Old Flame, I followed all of these lessons. And I'm very happy with the results, but ultimately you're the judge. And you're in luck because I'm debuting the song at the end of this video. In the comments, let me know what you think and share any lessons that have helped you transform your lyrics. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate your time. I hope you're doing well. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you around. I peek through the curtain of bangs over your left eye. And fingertips burn as my hands press against your side. The DJ plays songs from 2005 And we dance like shadows in the neon light Oh, that old flame burning again That old flame, it's not the same Still I'm begging that old flame to start burning Like a river that's never been frozen in ice I know that we're broken and we never change But when you start to smolder, I can't look away from that old Again, that old flame, it's not the same. Still, I'm begging that old flame to start burning again, or for that old flame to let me. Your doorway that night And the moths that fluttered overhead When your lips met mine I rolled down the window But I know it's too late Your smoke's in my veins And I'm drawn like a moth into that Same, but still I'm begging that old flame to start burning again Or for that old flame to let me